Okay, let's uh, let's start up here on uh, what the 20th, I think, of September. William Neal with the local group in Biology of Fishes. Um, it's a Thursday, and uh, we're going to begin a two-part session on respiration that sort of complements the lab that we've already done. At least some of us have already done it. I hope those at a distance are in the process. Um, I know some of the folks are. I've already had a, some data come come my way. I hope Donovan's getting data from other um, other folks among you. Remember this in this lab the idea is that you are going to submit your own data set. Uh, you each did two reps or will do two reps of each uh, treatment, eight records and all. And uh, we need those data for the group to process. So please go ahead and submit your data to Donovan. And that's regardless of whether you're a uh, a 417 student or a 617 student or even in one case as a, uh, one of my professional courtesy audit folks has submitted data. So uh, today I'd like to uh, start uh, a consideration, a little more formal consideration of respiration. I promised you in uh, uh, the lecture session, which did not get posted by accident to the record, but I have done so now, and uh, then I neglected to let uh, Jessica know that. I promised that I would send out an email as soon as I had, and I forgot to do that, Ray. Anyhow, I, you know, I got so many files and, and so much confusion going on in my head, I don't know what I've done and what I haven't done. Some of you may appreciate that. Um, but what I didn't do was um, upload the... Uh, file from the lecture session on Tuesday. I did upload the two files from lab. And in the lecture session, uh, now that those of you who were here would have heard me say that we're having trouble with our uh, university communications these days. And so I wanted to provide an alternate uh, email address in case you send me an email and I don't reply. Uh, that most likely means that uh, I don't, I'm not getting your email at the university site, so I usually am pretty responsive. So send me, uh, send me another one at that address if you don't get one from tmu.edu. And I would ask that those of you locally write this down on your handout that just came around. I've included it on the revised version of the black and white that's posted on the server, but I didn't do it before I mimeographed or before I Xeroxed this. So it's wh underscore neil at, at yahoo.com. Um, the primitive form of respiration or um, oxygen uptake in fishes is by way of gills. But a number of fishes have turned to air breathing uh, to one extent or another. And some have really uh, gotten to be specialists at it, and so I'd like to sort of uh, talk about that first and then dispense with that and move on to gills. Um, air breathing has arisen many different times uh, among animals, uh, fishes included. And uh, so lots of different structures and uh, lots of different... Uh, uh, behaviors are involved in air breathing. Uh, some fishes uh, do it when it's to their advantage to do it. That is, they are facultative air breathers. When oxygen is deficient in the water, they turn to the air, where it's almost always sufficient. Other forms, uh, I guess, have gotten evolutionarily so used to uh, low oxygen situations that they have become obligatory air breathers. And some of the lung fishes fit into that category. Um, just about everything about the fish you can think of can function in air breathing from the skin and fin membranes to the gut and its various parts. Um, some fishes have developed special structures as uh, evaginations from the gut, either a swim bladder or a, a true lung that uh, really is a a very specialized uh, organ for respiration. The common feature that 
these air breathing fishes have is the fact that they live in habitats that are chronically low in oxygen. And since such habitats are typically freshwater habitats, uh, most of the air breathing fishes, the real specialists, live in freshwater, not the marine environment. Um, water breathing is the is the real um, dominant and primitive form of respiration, oxygen uptake. And all of you have heard, I'm sure, somewhere along the way that uh, teleos have a very uh, elegant system for countercurrent exchange between the blood and the water that facilitates the transfer of respiratory gases and other materials across the between the fish and water interface across that interface. And um, so I've copied some old drawings here that I intended to uh, try to show you with um, the details of how this all works. And like I say, most of you probably know it. Up above is, uh, is sort of a section, a frontal section through the pharyngeal region of a typical fish. And I'm showing three of the four or five, depending, um, gill arches on one side of the fish, the right side. As usual, the top of the slide is anterior and the bottom is posterior. And so here are the bony arches. Uh, the X, I guess, marks the bony structure in the center of the branchial arches. And uh, there may be uh, extensions here, uh, skeletal extensions that are anything from just little nubs to very fine uh, uh, needle-like projections. These are the gill rakers that serve to strain things out of the flow of water as it comes in and passes uh, between the gill arches. Um, then on the uh, lateral sides of the gill arches are the gill filaments which are arranged in in two rows uh, along the outer edge of each arch. And it's the gill filaments that you see when you open up the opercle of an ordinary fish and look inside and see the red tissue. Uh, the red being the hemoglobin. Um, so um, it's a little hard to talk from the from the schematic. It's even harder to talk from the from an actual anatomical picture of this. But what you got are these rows of filaments arising out of the drawing here, sort of curving from anterior to posterior and then back anteriorly as they rise along the outside of the arch. And the filaments that are members of each pair uh, on adjacent arches sort of uh, extend and actually come in contact at their distal ends, uh, proximal being the end toward the center of the fish or toward the object where the attachment is, and then distal being further away. That's anatomical jargon. So you got the filaments coming in contact here and what that does is amount to uh, a high resistance pathway for the water. So the water tends to flow across the filaments between filaments that are in the same row, the row here and over here for example, and then pass out uh, in this pattern and then into the opercular uh, space and then finally out through the uh, opercular slit, the opercle itself. So um, why is that? Well, that's, I suppose, uh, a functional arrangement that has arisen to uh, promote a very efficient transfer of stuff across the epithelium of the gill between the blood that's inside and the water that's that we've talked about. Okay, so I've all I've said is about the water, and I've shown the water is passing uh, across the filaments. And here, as you as you look down here, you can see the pattern of blood flow. Maybe before that, we look out here on the on a section of one of these filaments at the little uh, secondary filaments or lamellae, which I think is a better label. These are little um, 
surface area structures, I guess is the best thing to call them. That's where the actual exchange occurs. And the water's flowing between the lamellae and across the, the primary filament. And then the blood is flowing in the opposite direction through the capillary network that's in the lamella. Um, so the pattern of blood flow it looks like this. Um, the blood, remember, comes from the ventral aorta and then passes vertically through the branchial vessels, uh, the afferent branchial vessels, meaning uh, the word A or the, the letter A in afferent has to do with to or towards uh, some point, some point of reference. And the point of reference we're going to talk about is the site of gas exchange in the lamella itself. So it's afferent to the lamella. So at the level of each pair of these filaments that come off the arch, a, a branch of this branchial afferent vessel arises and flows down the, the inner or the medial sides, I guess you would say, of the filament and then gives up branches again at each lamella and those become finally the capillaries that lie in the epithelium here of the gill lamella. That blood's collected on the other side of the lamella and by now what's called an efferent vessel and that efferent vessel carries it back to the gill arch to the efferent branchial vessel that rises and ultimately ends in the in the dorsal aorta or the aorta. So that's kind of the pattern and it probably was easier to see than for me to describe. You probably already knew. But in effect what you've got is a very intimate connection between the water that's ventilating the gill and the blood that's, that's flowing through the gill, that's perfusing the gill. Uh, before I leave this figure, is there any part of this that's not making sense to the local group? You may have all seen this several times and really don't need to see it again, but there may be some among you who haven't. So, um, what does this do for the fish? Well, what it does is promote very, very efficient exchange. Uh, it assures that the water that has the greatest amount of oxygen the incurrent water uh, exchanges with the blood that has the greatest uh, accumulated level of oxygen so that the differential is maintained in the right direction. Uh, if you look at a graph of oxygen, and here I've graphed something I'm going to call oxygen percent saturation to try to delay the consideration of partial pressure issues a little bit here. But just think of it this way. Uh, the water and the blood can each hold a certain amount of oxygen per unit volume. And so I'm graphing those relative to each other as a percent saturation. And I'm doing that uh, as a function on X here of relative position uh, along the lamella. Uh, the uh, afferent side of the lamella here to the efferent side of one lamella. So as the blood moves uh, from afferent to efferent, and this is from the blood's point of view, as the blood moves, it comes into the lamella, presumably deficient in oxygen. It's maybe only got uh, uh, 5 to 10 percent of its capacity as venous blood coming back. And, uh, and it encounters uh, oxygen that has maybe 20 to 40 percent of its oxygen capacity. And so there's a partial pressure or a, a, a diffusion gradient that um, allows for the, the uh, continued or uh, the passage of blood from from water to oxygen. Then, as the as the blood passes along the lamella, um, it gains more oxygen because the water that's flowing in the opposite direction still has um, a greater relative uh, a relative uh, amount of oxygen and finally as the blood leaves the lamella now as arterial blood it has gained enough oxygen from the water to 
to approach uh, saturation um, saturation of its hemoglobin and uh, and it's you know able to do this because it's dealing with the the richest water at this point is that making sense so the water's going that way it's giving up its oxygen to the blood which is going that way and you're not going to get more uh, oxygen in the blood than you do in the water at any particular point along this system in in terms of the partial pressure gradient which is is what I'm I'm trying to get around talking about yet by saying capacity or, or percent saturation. The reason I got to do that is because the water holds so much less oxygen than the blood per unit volume because the water doesn't have a pigment that specializes in binding oxygen and taking it out of solution got 10 times, 20 times more capacity, 20 times probably in most cases. So in, in this sort of thing, it helps, I think, to sort of build your own little simulation model in your head. You can build one in Stella, and we do later on. We'll deal with simulating countercurrent transfer of stuff when we talk about heat transfer in, in uh, countercurrent heat exchangers of tunas. We've got a lab that focuses sort of on that. But now, for now, we can still uh, think constructively about this. Uh, so um, suppose you turn a system on its end and reverse uh, the flow of water so that it starts out over here on the afferent side. And folks have actually done this experimentally. You know, with an excised gill, take the... Or, or, just reverse the water flow one way or another across the lamella so that the water comes in on this side at that point uh, 85 to 99 percent oxygen saturated well you know immediately there's this big driving gradient between the oxygen that's in the water that water and the blood and so the two rush together in the sense that oxygen rushes across uh, r relatively of course rushes by diffusion on this big driving gradient and so what you end up with is the oxygen in the water falling rapidly and the oxygen in the blood rising rapidly and maybe partway through the exchanger, partway across the lamella, the two kind of equilibrate. And you end up with water and blood both leaving the system. Uh, water with still a good bit of its oxygen left and blood that hasn't completely loaded all the oxygen it needs to saturate it. So that would be uh, that would be concurrent exchange or, or with con meaning with uh, the flows in the same direction as opposed to counter or opposite. Um, another thing to point out, I think, here at this point is that you know this is a this is a optimization game that's played by the animal in terms of the rate at which it's pumping its blood through the capillary networks in the lamellae and the rate at which it's pumping the water over its gills, the ventilation rate versus the perfusion, blood perfusion rate. If you imagined a situation where uh, energy and metabolic cost were no object and the water were being pumped at a very rapid rate so that it was always fresh all the way across the gill, uh, you know, you can imagine that, that the water curve would go straight across at 100% or near it, maybe dipping just slightly, and leave the exchange arena still with 90% of its oxygen. And sure enough, that would, that would give you a very good uh, loading because you can imagine that the blood is going to rise rapidly and is going to be almost saturated by the time it's even partly through the exchange arena. Has everybody got a picture of that? Can I do this? Let me try here at the risk of... Okay, we're going to try drawing pictures here. What I've got is in mind is a situation, instead of the, the water following this curve, let's suppose the water follows a curve that looks more like this. In other words, we're pumping the water so fast that it's hardly losing any oxygen. The blood, because there's such a big driving gradient now, Picks up oxygen quickly. I should have changed the color, but I didn't want to take time to do it. 
And so you can imagine a situation like that where the blood is equilibrating um, with the water only partway through the gill. Well, that's going to achieve um, very efficient, or not very efficient, but very effective loading of the hemoglobin with oxygen, but at, the, at what cost? The cost being the cost of pumping water so fast. So that's, that's, a, that's a cost that has to be borne. Fish don't want to do anything they don't have to do. They're like you and me. So what they do is back off on the pumping of the water so that they achieve this kind of relationship and have the blood just saturated when it leaves the gill. That's the goal. No more, no less. Don't saturate it any sooner. And you got to saturate it by the time you leave or there's no chance the blood's left the arena at that point. So that would be one you know, scenario uh, where you're pumping water real fast. Well, what if you pump water real slow, you know? Well, let me see. I guess i got to get out of my stop drawing. Whoops. I didn't want to go to that. I just wanted to go back to this. You know, the other alternative would be, okay, well, you just don't pump so much water, and, and so pointer, pointer, pointer options. I forgot, I forgot what I was doing. I'll show you Alt-Z. Okay, the other alternative would be to, you know, just slow down on that water, but then if you did that, you know, the water would just be going like this. Sure enough, the water would leave at low oxygen, you know, but fish doesn't really care how much oxygen's left in the water. That's not the goal. The goal is to get the oxygen in the blood, and the blood would, you know, the blood would flow like this, and and maybe it would, you know, leave mostly loaded, but you'd run the risk that you didn't completely saturate it. So, you know, what what the game is is to is to optimize the two flows, and I'll talk about some of the ways that fish operate to play that game. So um, everybody can tell me, if I ask them, I bet, you know, why you wouldn't want to have the flow of the water and the blood be in the same direction. Because you'd end up leaving the exchanger with blood that wasn't fully, you know, sort of splitting the difference between the blood and the water and having both of them leave with more oxygen than I mean, with a middle level. Yeah, Valdemar. Uh, Well, is that uh, uh, so? Valdemar is saying that people who are doing uh, genetic uh, engineering of fish for for better growth may reduce the size of the head genetically, and this could have a consequence of reducing the gill. Is it a fact that the gills themselves have a reduced area when you reduce the head, or That's so? Yeah. So ventilation is increased in situations like that. So it would be interesting to do some respirometry with these fish and find out what happens. So we're talking about nature's engineering here instead of human. And humans can always find some extremes, I guess, to, to uh, examine. So teleos gills have countercurrent exchange and that enables efficient uh, oxygen uptake and carbon dioxide excretion and efficient heat transfer for that matter. Elasmobranch gills, on the other hand, uh, employ a different strategy that involves concurrent flow, but still achieves some of the advantage of countercurrent exchange. And I think this is a redrawing from Dave Randall's, uh, one of his papers in uh, fish physiology from years ago. Um, and I, you know, again, you could look at the the photographs, but uh, they don't make a lot of sense to me. So I think drawings help or help with the ideas at least. And the idea here is that uh, water and blood are flowing in the same direction, so they're concurrent. But the whole idea is that a that a parcel of the blood that is afferent to the exchanger 
uh, actually comes in close contact with the with the water through the epithelium there. And that part, that little parcel, uh, gains oxygen quickly. And once it's saturated, once it's equilibrated with the oxygen that's left in the water at that point, it leaves the exchange arena. Uh, it's removed from the site of exchange and its, its place is taken by another parcel. And so I've got five of these things. That's not important. It's just a representative. It could have been 500 of them, I guess, or 50 at least. And so each, each parcel achieves its own equilibration with the DO or with the partial pressure actually of oxygen that's in, in the water at that point. And the consequence is, if you uh, make the drawing properly, that you end up with five parcels. Uh, if they all are of equal volume, then the average for those five is higher than the average um, oxygen in the water that's expired. So you you actually achieve uh, some of the advantages of countercurrent exchange without having a countercurrent exchanger. Like everything else, you know, sharks and teleos tend to do things very differently, suggesting that those two groups are very, very far apart in their, you know, that their origins are, are way back there, their separation. Um, so, you know, those are the ideas about uh, how the system looks or how the system works and some superficial indication of how it looks. And now I'd like to do, as, as I always try to do, is take you into the more quantitative aspects because in order to uh, analyze um, results and particularly in order to simulate processes, you can't uh, just look at pictures. you got to have equations uh, that do things and, and numbers uh, in those equations. So I want to talk to you about some numbers. <clears throat> and I'll begin by talking about dimensions of the gill itself and let A represent uh, the area of the lamellae sort of integrated and believe it or not folks have actually estimated the area of gill lamellae by doing things like uh, coating them with some sort of material and then determining how much it takes to achieve a good coat or counting all the lamellae on a gill arch and then estimating the area of each one and then multiplying by the estimated, that sort of thing. And the result is that, uh, as you would expect, the area, the total area, anatomically, uh, tends to be uh, a function of the level of activity and the size of the individual fish Maybe by maybe it's head size if Valdemar's right. Uh, sluggish, uh, more sluggish forms tend to have uh, lesser amounts of area per unit mass. Um, and I've got the figure here for goosefish: uh, 1.4 square centimeters of area per gram of body weight. Highly active forms like tunas. Uh, way up there, 18 centimeters squared, and that approaches the alveolar area of a mammalian lung, which I think is 20 to 30, probably in young adults. Um, Telios average about 5 centimeters squared per gram. As I indicated, uh, there's the usual uh, tendency for anything that's connected to uh, metabolism <coughs> to have a functional relationship to animal size in keeping with the fact that the smaller the animal, the higher its, its metabolic rate. And gill area is no exception. The gill area is proportionate to uh, weight to about the 0.85 power, which is uh, going to come up again and again, something between 0.75 and 0.85. Uh, so if you think about that power function, and, um, you know, you could go and pull out the functional relationships um, Excel file that I have posted and play with the power function and try out different values of that exponent and see what happens to the shape of the curve. It'll happen on the fly. I mean, you just put it in and it'll automatically respond once you click. Well, what you'd see is that, you know, if, if, a, and if, if, if a is a directly proportional to weight, if it's A is proportional to weight to the first power, then 
then you've got a straight line relationship between area and weight. As weight increases, the area increases linearly. Uh, if the power is something between 0 and 1, as it is here, it's 0.85. What that means is you've got a, a more rapid increase in area when weight is small in the smaller ranges. And then as weight increases, the, the, the curve is con, uh, is con uh, vex up or concave down. So um, bigger fish are gaining area at a slower pace the bigger they get. Um, if the number were greater than one, then you got something that's accelerating, something that's, con that's concave up. But rather than having me say these words, please give yourself the insight by going and opening up that file, if you're not familiar with this, and just playing with the powers and see what happens. So smaller fish have more area per unit weight, but bigger fish have more area. Uh, the power is positive, so the bigger the fish, the more area you're going to have. It's just that it ha they have more, they have less area per unit weight than small fish. The functional area is less than the anatomical area. Uh, maybe typically uh, 60 to 70 percent, and there's a relationship between the proportion of anatomical area that's functional and the level of activity of the fish. When fish are engaged in standard low level of routine metabolism, uh, a lot of the capillaries in the lamellae are, are closed or patent so that no blood is flowing through them. Then as blood pressure increases with activity, that opens up the open capillaries and so the functional area approaches more closely to the, to the actual anatomical area. And obviously the significance of all this is that the rate of transfer of everything that is transferred at the gills is going to be proportionate to area, the functional area. Another thing that's going to affect the rate of transfer of stuff at the gill is going to be the distance over which the stuff has to, has to move. And I represent that by, by delta x, meaning the, the thickness. Um, lamellar epithelium in teleos is typically one to five microns thick. Um, and it tends to be thinner for more active fish and thicker for less active fish. But the anatomical uh, thickness of the lamella is maybe uh, of less importance than the total effective thickness, which is greatly increased by uh, stagnant blood and stagnant water. In other words, that's the reason, one reason for moving blood and moving water fast is you get less in the way of dead areas or, or stagnant areas um, along the actual uh, epithelial surface. So um, if fish are not moving their, their water or their blood at a, at a rapid pace, the effective diffusion distance can greatly increase on both sides of the epithelium. And it's even worse or more exaggerated by uh, mucus production on the epithelium of the gill. And one of the, one of the commonest effects of, of toxic materials is that they are irritants. And irritants stimulate fish to produce mucus. The design, obviously, functionally, is to reduce the rate of transfer of whatever the toxic material is into the fish. But you can't do that without also reducing the rates of transfer of things you want to move, like oxygen and carbon dioxide. And so some toxic materials literally suffocate fish by stimulating so much mucus production at the gill that the fish can't uh, exchange enough oxygen. Delta X can go up to 30 to 40 microns. So why is that important? Well, we'll find out. Um, that Fick told us that it's important because the rate of transfer is inversely proportional to the distance through which the transfer has to occur. Directly proportional to area over which it occurs, but inversely proportional to the distance, the thickness. Um, 
Oxygen uptake uh, versus ventilation. Ventilation in fishes um, ranges from almost none, uh, let's say five-tenths of a liter per minute per kilogram uh, when the fish is at rest, sluggish forms up to maybe five liters of water being pumped over the gills per minute for every kilogram of mass in, in a fish like a salmon when it's uh, engaged in a lot of activity, when it's approaching active metabolism. Um, increases in the ventilating rate are triggered by um, some things that are complementary to one another really by low environmental oxygen so you put fish in situations where environmental DO drops they increase their ventilation rates. Uh, high levels of environmental CO2 uh, cause the same response and exercise or being forced to be active which really is is a sort of a uh, intrinsic, I guess, uh, cause of both the other two conditions because if the fish exercises as far as the mitochondria are concerned, that means low oxygen supply uh, relative to demand and high CO2 uh, levels. In other words, exercise can cause these other two conditions in effect. So they can be either environmental or exercise induced. Um, the thing that controls ventilation is uh, is breathing movements that fish make, in, in normal cases at least. Um, and when I say normal, I'm talking about fish that actually uh, use uh, buccal and, and uh, opercular movements to pump the water over their gills. Some fish don't. Tunas uh, have secondarily given up on this uh, mode of operation and rely on what's called ramjet ventilation. So they don't have the pumping apparatus anymore. They just open their mouths and swim. And the column of water in front of their mouth goes over their gills. So tunas have to swim faster in order to breathe more. Other fish don't have to do that. They can sit still and breathe faster. Uh, the medulla uh, controls the breathing movements in you and me and in, in ordinary fishes. I'm not sure about tunas. Um, there are oxygen receptors in several, at several points in the circulatory system beginning with the epithelium of the gills and, and all the way to the venous system and there's been a, a debate for, for a long time about exactly where it is fish are sensing oxygen and how sensitive they are to it and one thing that is evident is that fishes do have a lot of sensitivity to uh, oxygen per se. Whereas you and I don't really have much uh, ability to sense uh, oxygen insufficiency. What we, what we sense is the, is the accumulation of uh, CO2. That's what triggers uh, breathing in, in mammals. But fishes independently have an oxygen sense that will stimulate uh, breathing movements. And some people have said, well, they've got to be in the gill because it's so fast. You know, it couldn't be anywhere else. There's not time for the blood to carry the signal or the blood to carry low oxygen to some place like the venous system because the fish is responding almost immediately. The pseudobranch, which is the false gill in, in Telios, has been identified as a place where there's oxygen receptors. Um, VO2 increases, uh, oxygen uptake increases with increased ventilation and uh, the functional relationship tends to be a, a negative exponential of that form and when the oxygen uptake increases uh, with increasing ventilation, uh, utilization falls with increasing ventilation and rather than looking at the, the math there, it's easier to look at the graphs for most folks. Here is that negative upgoing exponential of oxygen uptake as a function of increased ventilation from this half liter per kilogram per minute minimum to the maximum of about an order of magnitude greater. Everybody understands that an order of magnitude is uh, uh, more jargon meaning a, a factor of 10. So 
5 is an order of magnitude greater than 0.5. 10 is an order of magnitude greater than 1. So over this order of magnitude increase in ventilation rate, oxygen uptake goes from almost nil to the maximum, and you can see it's approaching the VO2 max here of the, exponent, the, the, the asymptotic value. You know, I hate to keep saying that, but if you just look back at this, you can see that when VO2 gets close to VO2 max, dVO2 dV, that is the rate of change in oxygen uptake with respect to change in in ventilation is going to go to zero, and so that's what's happening here. Starts out greatest when the difference is greatest. And the complement of that is that utilization falls, so that if fish are ventilating at a low rate, then um, yeah, they're utilizing almost all the oxygen that's in the water, but they're not getting a lot because there's not a lot of water being pumped. Then when they pump a lot of water, uh, they they get a lot of oxygen, but they, they waste a lot of oxygen, too, so to speak. In other words, utilization may fall to 10% at maximum ventilation. Uh, as I pointed out, you know, it's, a, it's an optimization game. You don't want to waste energy by pumping more water to, than you need to pump and, and let it leave still containing a lot of the oxygen that it had. And in this case, you got 90% of the oxygen still there when the water leaves through the opercular opening. For maximally active fish, um, you know, and these, I'm kind of going back now and reviewing some things that I said in the lab uh, on Tuesday. For maximally active fish, VO2 increases with DO, and at first, at low DOs, the increase is almost linear, and then it reaches an asymptote and the asymptote is typically for fishes about one milligram of oxygen per gram per hour, except in larval forms and except in tunas. Resting fish, uh, well, rather than reading the words, there's the graph again. In the case of resting fish, the, the, the relationship uh, starts out the same, but then rapidly asymptotes at a low value for standard metabolism. And the, the breakaway we call the critical oxygen concentration. I refer you to my comments in the lab. Yes, Alejandro. Uh, going back to the uh, ventilation and the uptake. Uh, going back to the ventilation and the yeah, uptake. I understand that. This one? Yeah, the parameters that increase ventilation, but what do you think that maybe when uh, water quality is bad or there's circumstances that, uh, that would be hazardous for the fish that actually ventilation would actually be the like So, yeah, let me paraphrase, and, and, you know, I would be handing this microphone back and forth, except it's logistically so time-consuming. Alejandro says... If water quality is bad, is it possible ventilation would be reduced? In other words, would the fish try to hold its breath to avoid exposure? Um, you know, I don't know about that. I, my guess is they can just keep panting and hasten the end, you know. I don't know. I don't know the answer if fish in situations that are noxious would, would reduce ventilation. I don't think so, though. guess not be my guess. So there's the active resting that you've seen before and um, talked about the mechanisms that are involved in maintenance of, of the standard rate being the being a relatively flat line, you know, and it's got to do with these compensatory mechanisms. The fish is getting all the oxygen it needs and so it gets lazier and lazier as DO rises and it doesn't have to be efficient, but then as DO falls, it has to start bringing in these compensatory mechanisms. It has to do things like, um, well, let's see, what have I got here? VO2 of resting fish is relatively constant at DOs above DO crit because as DO decreases, the ventilation rate increases, heart rate decreases, and stroke volume increases, and maybe the venous oxygen decreases, although I think there's a lot of doubt about that. So 
you know, what's happening is the fish is doing all the things it can to be more efficient and to compensate, to maintain its standard of, of living, so to speak, its standard metabolic rate as DO approaches DO crit. But when DO hits DO crit, then it's done everything it can. It's exhausted all of its uh, compensatory responses and, and it only, then only it can shut, it has to then shut down systems. Um, and shutting down the systems, if they're by definition uh, obligatory, then that that's why I claim that DO crit is effectively the lethal DO. Um, metabolic scope is the difference between active and standard metabolic rate. Um, above this point, that some folks would say is the limiting DO for active metabolism. It's typically around five or six milligrams per liter. There's no gain in metabolic scope as DO goes higher than as DO goes lower. Metabolic scope becomes progressively reduced. And finally here at the critical oxygen it's gone to zero. Routinely active fish are ones that are doing the things that are ecologically necessary to uh, for them to continue on the long-term basis. And the picture is basically the same uh, for routine metabolism as it is for standard. Uh, and I've drawn these jiggles just to show you that, in, that normally fish are, are pretty variable and pretty haphazard, I guess, in a short-term sense about their routine metabolic rates. In other words, they're, they're varying these various things that give rise to to these variable uh, oxygen uptake rates. But on average, the routine rate is pretty flat. Uh, maybe not quite as flat as the resting or standard rate, but pretty flat all the same. And typically about twice as high above the origin here as the standard rate. I don't know if I mentioned this little hump when we talked in the lab, but maybe I didn't even show it. Maybe I didn't want to confuse the issue, but what seems to be happening there is that fish is doing these compensatory things that are designed to help it maintain itself at the routine metabolic rate as DO availability falls. But when DO availability gets low enough that the compensatory processes start to be insufficient, uh, typically what happens here, and we're talking only a maybe a half a part of per million oxygen above the limiting oxygen concentration, oxygen uptake actually increases. Remember this is a transient state situation. You know, we're seeing these things typically happen in respirometers and the amount of time involved is sort of dependent on the volume of the respirometer and the metabolic rate. So this half a part fall may occur only in a matter of five minutes. And during that period, uh, VO2 increases and if you watch carefully you can see clearly that the fish is distressed and the fish is actually starting to panic, starting to move more, starting to breathe faster, typically. And uh, so that results in an increase in oxygen uptake rate. Maybe it's starting to shut something else down and it gains a little bit of ground as a result. But then as DO falls even lower that fails. So in a respirometer you know there's no escape. In nature, it well could be that this kind of behavior would be adaptive because uh, a panicked search for a better place might uh, actually succeed in putting the fish in a better environment than the one it finds itself in. In other words, a place where there's more oxygen. Maybe it goes to the surface, which is a typical response. Well, it can't go to the surface in the respirometer if it's sealed. So then it finally... You know, finally, uh, all of that uh, uh, panicked activity um, results in, I guess, an accumulation of an oxygen debt or something, and most fish aren't real good at anaerobic metabolism, so the, they, sh they simply stop swimming and stop trying at that point, and that's when you're here. You're starting to lose uh, the things that make the difference between bare survival and ordinary uh, living from day to day, routine met metabolic rates. This difference we call the, the 
metabolic scope for growth. And I will say one more thing I didn't say in lab, and that is we're very interested uh, uh, in this, this point here that we call the limiting oxygen concentration. Um, and the routine metabolic rate that corresponds with that limiting oxygen concentration. And the argument that, that we've made, and the one that you can read in this paper on ecophys.fish, is that uh, this is a measure of the uh, relative uh, fitness of fish and environment and, and in the context of the history of the fish in that environment. And the, the, the flatter that line is, the worse things are. In other words, if you take the ratio of the routine metabolic rate to the limiting oxygen concentration for that rate, just divide one into the other, the value you get we call marginal metabolic scope. It's the, basically, it's the slope of this line at the margins of metabolic scope. And the argument is the steeper that line, the better the situation the more productive that particular fish can be in that world. And so far that's holding up very well. In other words, if you have a higher marginal metabolic scope, then you can grow better, you can do everything better there than you could if things are worse, which gives a flatter line. So just keep that in mind as we move along through the course and, and you, 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 you understand then why it's so important uh, why, why I would argue that it's so important as, as reflected in ecofish that fish uh, have a large, that, that they optimize or maximize metabolic scope for growth to the extent that they can. Okay, so that's part one. And the only reason I broke this into two parts was because the uh, files were so long they became unwieldy. There's a lot of pictures in these. So what I'm going to do is stop this one and move on to uh, part two, which I already have up. And uh, there's really no break in ideas here. Oh, I've got another handout for you. I didn't know how, where we would get. So I'm going to pass this around to the local group. Start back here with Cameron. Thank you for looking around for where's the handout. Because I forgot to hand it. Okay, I'm going to pause just for a minute while we pass around this handout. You know, while we've been away here, We've been having fun. Julie's been teaching the sign language for how to make a fish in the swim motion. And uh, he, she also thinks we've got R, too. And it, I don't know if the red has anything to do with crossed fingers. I mean, that's R, but two sets of crossed fingers. She's going to do us a video doing red fish. She knows blue fish. She got that already. That's pretty cool. Okay. We need to put a brand on, on the eco fish like that, see? <laughs> You know, speaking of, uh, of, of little uh, signals, and you know, the very first model that anybody <coughs> built that I worked with was built by Jim Bryan, and he modeled, um, he modeled a uh, random walk. And when his fish failed the test and went over the lethal edge, it turned upside down and got little X's on its eyes. He actually had that programmed in. <laughs> and this was back in the days of peaks and pokes and apple, you know, and it took a whole lot of work to do that, too. <laughs> Anyhow, we didn't call him J and B Rare for nothing. So, we'll <laughs> with that said, and that's on the record, by the way, so we'll, we'll move <laughs> on here. Talk about uh, some more respiration stuff. And I guess this is going to take us into what I would call oxygen and carbon dioxide transport and the, maybe the first and the major point is the obvious one and that is that oxygen is carried mostly uh, bound to uh, hemoglobin in the red blood cells or on the red blood cells actually and uh, about uh, 20 times more oxygen is carried that way in fully saturated blood than in solution in the plasma and uh, the hemoglobin and its capacity to carry oxygen means that blood has fully saturated uh, blood, fish blood, uh, has 20 times more oxygen per unit volume than the water the fish was breathing when it's fully saturated. 
carbon dioxide, um, it also turns out, and you may or may not have known this, that uh, CO2 is also uh, partly carried uh, bound to hemoglobin in a form called carboaminohemoglobin. HB is the standard uh, symbolism for hemoglobin, not to be confused with HG, which is mercury. I've had people kind of get those backwards. HB is hemoglobin. Um, so 20% uh, of the carbon dioxide that's transported from the mitochondria back to the gills for excretion is carried bound to hemoglobin. 75% um, in solution as bicarbonate ion in the plasma and maybe 5% is free CO2. Uh, oh, yes, I'm not... Thank you. Going to presentation mode would be helpful. Thank you for saying that. So hemoglobin figures into transport both of not just oxygen but also carbon dioxide. And then here's a fairly busy uh, thing from uh, actually adapted from uh, Malcolm Gordon's animal physiology book some time ago. My attempt to uh, sort of represent in a fairly serious way the transport and the way you have to read this is that you know you start over here on the right get my cursor back um, with the water and then uh, things go from the water into solution in the plasma and then are bound at the red blood cell and then the red blood cell turns it loose and it goes back into the plasma and into the tissue uh, so, you know, oxygen's making the trip in one direction and CO2 is hopefully making the trip in the other direction, typically. So maybe it'd be easier to start down here below the dashed line with oxygen. Oxygen dissolving in the water where five to maybe 10% of it stays in solution. The other 90 to 95% is bound to hemoglobin, the reduced hemoglobin to form oxyhemoglobin. And that binding of oxygen with hemoglobin is facilitated by the release of carbon dioxide from the hemoglobin at the gill. Um, I told you already that 20% or so of the carbon dioxide is carried as carbaminohemoglobin. And so following the carbon dioxide now we go carbon dioxide uh, as carbaminohemoglobin uh, Bicarbonate, carbon dioxide, the fast carbonic anhydrase uh, facilitated reaction to carbon dioxide in solution in the plasma. And finally, the elimination of carbon dioxide either in the free form into the water or as bicarbonate ion. The excretion of bicarbonate ion is facilitated by, or facilitates, maybe is better, the uh, uh, selection or the uptake of of, carb of chloride ion. And I think what's missing here may be the whole thing about uh, ammonia and sodium. But I'm not going to worry about the details of this any more than I would expect you to. My, my main message from all this is that Oxygen is mostly carried bound to hemoglobin, uh, 90 to 95 percent of it. And carbon dioxide is carried bound to the hemoglobin, um, but most of it is in solution as bicarbonate and a little bit of it as free carbon dioxide. There's a lot of fancy buffering going on. Fish blood, by the way, by the way, is is not nearly as well buffered as as mammal blood typically. So there's much more of a pH swing in it. To me, this is uh, the more important figure. Um, my attempt to uh, show for the compartments that are uh, the ones I'd like to focus on: the water and the gill the tissues and the arterial blood and the venous blood here, the relative amounts of oxygen carbon dioxide in terms of partial pressures. 
Um, air saturated water, uh, air that's got, you know, water that's exposed uh, in equilibrium with air that has the full uh, 21% oxygen would be, well, you know, air is 760 uh, millimeters mercury total pressure and about 20, 21% of that's oxygen, so I think most people would use 160 as the partial pressure of oxygen in normal air. And uh, so in passing through the gill, uh, the blood would maybe gain almost uh, full saturation. I've got it at 140, which is sort of a normal figure. So that would be about uh, 85, 90% saturation, I guess. Um, I'm sorry, let me back off and not say that. Let me say that the water would start out with 140 that the fish is breathing. And as the blood passes through the gill, the amount of oxygen actually in solution would probably be 50 to 80 millimeters of mercury. These are measured values. Um, so at the same time the, the blood is passing through the gill and picking up oxygen, it's losing CO2. CO2 in the atmosphere is almost zero, so um, there's a good transfer of CO2 out of the blood. This thing is a loop and it's hard to know where to start. I might have should have started with the tissues instead of the... Let's just go around and, and see. Okay, so what I'm claiming is that the blood leaves the arterial blood at 50 to 80 millimeters mercury because uh, some of the oxygen is still going onto the hemoglobin at that point, and so you end up with the plasma maybe not being as nearly saturated as you'd think it ought to be. Um, and in passing through the tissues, there's a big diffusion gradient. The tissues are using oxygen, so the the cytoplasm in the cells is low in its partial pressure, maybe 1 to 15 millimeters, so that's a big gradient, partial pressure gradient for oxygen to move into the tissues. The tissues are actively metabolizing, producing a lot of CO2, so the measured uh, partial pressures of carbon dioxide in the cytoplasm of the tissues, uh, actively metabolizing tissues, would be 3 to 15. Um, so then the venous blood is coming back to the gill, uh, very low in oxygen, maybe 3 to 20 millimeters mercury partial pressure, and almost the same partial pressure of CO2, 3 to 10. Now the blood's passing through the capillary exchangers, uh, the lamellae, and there's a CO2 gradient from 3 to 10 to nearly zero, so there's a nice pathway for loss of CO2. And there's a 3 to 20 to 140 gradient at, um, in the water, so there's a nice pathway for lots of, of gain. So uh, these are the numbers from the literature for a variety of fishes and um, under a variety of conditions. So there's a lot of range in the values. I'm going to use some of these numbers a little later. When I talk about fixed law, which is uh, a sort of a special case of a larger law, actually, and what it says is that the, uh, the rate of transfer of some material, a concentration of a diffusing substance, for example, is directly proportional to, uh, and these are things that we've already talked about in the case of the gill, uh, directly proportional to the area through which the exchange process is occurring and inversely proportional to the distance over which that occurs. And uh, it depends on the differential concentration or the difference in concentration over that distance. So all those things that we were just talking about are going to be important, you know, the maintenance of those big differences between things like the partial pressure of oxygen in the water and the partial pressure of oxygen in the, in the venous blood coming back to the gill. And then the other thing here, D is a is a is a is a, a measured empirical uh, coefficient to turn this proportionality into an equality with the right dimensions and everything. 
uh, D for all kinds of substances under all kinds of conditions is a, it has been measured and is tabled in all kinds of places, uh, both in paper and on the web these days. Um, I'll, I'll, use, I'll show you some of the numbers. So if I miss saying anything there, no, well, time, DT. So the rate at which something, uh, the rate at which the concentration of a diffusion substance changes with respect to time is proportional to the area through which the diffusion occurs, inverse proportional to the distance over which it occurs, and direct proportional to the, to the driving gradient of concentration. But uh, oxygen, uh, when you're talking blood and water, uh, has to be considered uh, carefully because the driving, the force that's driving the diffusion process isn't the concentration per se, it's the partial pressure, or which is one to one with the effective concentration in the plasma, all right, but as soon as some comes off the plasma, it's replaced or, or gained by the, by the pigment, the hemoglobin. So that makes for a, a complicated situation. So with with, the, with gases, you have to talk in terms of partial pressure to apply Fick's law instead of concentrations because gases diffuse at rates proportional to partial pressure gradients and not to concentration gradients. But the whole thing is made very complicated by the fact that the partial pressure gradient itself is affected by the degree to which the pigment is binding the gas. So as soon as some is removed, some more comes in. Or as soon as you build up the gas, partial pressure in the pigment or in the in the in the dissolved form in the plasma, it loads onto the pigment if there's any room left. So maybe this will sort of sort its way out as we talk about it. Um, Fick's law for gases, Henry's law. We thought Henry's law might relate to volumes and pressures and temperatures, Ray, but that, that's not Henry's law. This is Henry's law. I think we were talking Charles Gay-Lussac when we were talking about the relationship between the volume occupied by an ideal gas and the temperature and the pressure relationship. Henry's law says that the concentration of a gas is proportional to the pressure, the partial pressure of the gas, um, and the constant of proportionality, the thing that turns it from proportionality to an equation, is Bunsen's solubility coefficient. And Bunsen's solubility coefficient for all kinds of gases and all kinds of liquids has been tabled. I'll show you some of the values. Uh, Bunsen's coefficient instantaneously is a constant, at least, so you can write that the differential concentration is directly proportional to the partial pressure instantaneously. And so that gives rise to the form of Fick's law that uh, respiratory physiologists are used to seeing, actually with one more little fix, and that is the combination of this constant, the diffusion constant, with the solubility coefficient. Uh, the product of those two together uh, has been given a new name uh, for another guy that's famous in respiratory physiology, a guy named August Crow, it's the Crow's coefficient. So we finally end up with this, the rate at which the concentration of a gas changes across the epithelium, for example, of the gill is, is equal to Crow's coefficient times the area of the gill, the functional area, multiplied times the differential partial pressure of the gas across the epithelium and its layers of other stuff per unit distance uh, over that, uh, per unit distance for the diffusion to occur. Um, and the side on Bunsen's is that the magnitude depends on the specific gas, the liquid combination, the specific gas-liquid combination, the temperature and the salinity. Values for atmospheric gases and water at various temperatures and salinities are available in all kinds of places like CRC Handbook of Chemistry and Physics which is all online now. And I noticed last year when I said this, I said, yeah, and I've got a paper copy that I use for a book stop anymore, but it's a big, <laughs> thick thing, you know. Actually, I don't, it's, I kind of like it, you know, I kind of keep it in a favorite place. <laughs>
So uh, we can use the seawater values um, to approximate solubilities of gases in blood plasma because blood plasma is similar to seawater in its constituents. So we got time, and time is just right. I mean, before we launch into this calculation, we would want to stop, and we will. We'll pick it up here again on Tuesday. Thanks.